What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the fourth down in the Steel City podcast. It is the Steelers podcast for Odyssey, and we're back at it once again. And if you haven't noticed yet, if you're watching on YouTube, we're a little bit of a different setup once again. Not the full crew, but that's okay. All the same, before we get into all the fun stuff, I want to remind everybody, if you are listening to this podcast on the Odyssey app, follow this podcast on the Odyssey app. If you are listening on iTunes, follow this podcast on iTunes. That way you will get every update, every notification, because we are bringing content to you. Once this season kicks off, you will get it every single day or pretty much close to every day. We got enough to keep you going throughout the course of the season, because as a reminder, we're just a couple days away from week one. If anything, when you're listening to this, if it's you know the original time it's been downloaded or it's the original drop, the season pretty much kicks off tonight because we got a Thursday night game coming up. So we have content coming for you all day, every day. Well, not necessarily all day, but get the point. Bottom line, follow the podcast. You will get stuff from us every day. If you are watching on YouTube, hit first of all, hit like if you like this episode. Subscribe if you really like it. Make sure you tell your friends. Tell a friend to tell a friend to check this out on YouTube. You can always just hit that subscribe button below or that bell, whatever have you. Just do what you can. Check out the video and check out the audio for the podcast. Now, like I mentioned before, a bit of a different shakeup on the crew today. Yesterday, you had Chris Mack with Greg Finley because I was not available. I was under the weather. Not 100%, but I was probable this morning, so I'm making my best go of it. Although, we don't have Chris do Chris do some technical issues. We couldn't get him on today. So, no Chris today. But here's the weird part. It kind of feels like you're looking at San Francisco's depth chart for the Steelers and 49ers because the 49ers, they may or may not have George Kittle, Greg, based on the injury report. They may or may not have Nick Bosa based on his contract situation and his demands from the 49ers. Granted, Mike Tomlin said, hey, we're preparing as though we're going to see both guys on the field. But if George Kittle were to play, which I expect him to play, because as far as players go and as far as health and being able to you know, race to a certain level based on whatever injuries, whatever, George Kittle is one of those guys that, you know, he imagined he would use duct tape to just keep his leg attached to his hip and play. So I expect him to play. But it also brings another discussion that we want to talk about here. And this is the discussion of both George Kittle and the guys around him, Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey specifically. These are three guys that Mike Tomlin talked extensively about in the news conference leading up to this week. And more specifically about how these guys create matchup problems for the other teams. But when you're looking at these particular guys, there are three positions in in general that are going to have a little bit more of a matchup issue. Strong safety, inside linebacker, and that nickel corner position. So, Greg, now you're looking at three guys that make each of these matchups complicated. So, as far as that works, and I I know you guys talked about this yesterday, I'll start with giving my opinion on this because I feel that when you're talking about these particular guys – they all have the same tendencies. There are three guys that when it comes to their individual positions, they're good at them. Debo Sam is a good receiver. Christian McCaffrey is a good running back, and George Kittle is a good tight end. But when you put them outside of their normal duties is when they become dangerous. Because Christian McCaffrey, you can line him up anywhere as a wide receiver, outside, inside, he can make plays wherever. Debo Samuel, you can line him up wherever, and you can put him in the backfield, and he can make plays out of the backfield. George Kittle, besides being a really good blocking inline tight end and a good receiving tight end, you can also split him wide or move him around the line and make plays wherever you need to. So now it comes down to which combination the Steelers would have to use to try to neutralize these guys. Now, I know you and Chris talked about this yesterday, Greg, but if you're putting a group together in your mind that helps neutralize this group or at least tries to contain them, using the old Dan Patrick adage, how does this make sense for you? Well, if Kittle does play, I think it's the same thing that they do whenever they go up against Mark Andrews and the Ravens, and it's put Minka Fitzpatrick in that position where he's going to take your tight end out of the game or at least try to contain him. Here's the thing, though. If Kittle doesn't play, Minka can do his ball hawking thing and play anywhere he wants. Like, he's in center field. Anybody that comes into his area, he's ready to go. You don't have to take him – out of the ball hawking position and put him just on Kittle. So I like that opportunity either way. Put him on Kittle if he plays. If he doesn't play, you put him somewhere else. 
Demonte KZ, I think he'll be a big factor as well. He'll probably try and contain Debo, and you're going to have to put somebody on McCaffrey at all times. It'll more than likely be a linebacker that's going to try and stop McCaffrey, shadow him. But you have to lock him down, and we talked about this yesterday. If the 49ers can run the football effectively, it's going to make it a long day for the Steelers. You need to make Brock Purdy make plays. Purdy coming off of a surgery, a major surgery, you can't let McCaffrey run at will. You can't let Elijah Mitchell run at will. You have to stop the run and make Brock Purdy throw the football. However, I also look, Josh, Pat Fryermuth really wants to see George Kittle play in this game. I think he's the only Steeler that wants to see that <laughs> because he's a tight end. He's he's done some stuff with Kittle. He's done some camps and stuff or done some trainings with him. That's fine all and well, but I think everybody on that Steelers defense would prefer to not have George Kittle on the field on Sunday. Yeah, those tight ends have become their kind of fraternity, haven't they? They're, they're kind of fun. Uh, and and even, you know, some of the, the retired tight ends, like I know Greg Olson's wearing the TEU shirts too, as those guys were, I think Kittle was wearing it. Was it was it WrestleMania? He, he had an appearance wearing a TEU shirt. So they have become their own little fraternity, and it is kind of cool to watch. But at, to your point, I think you're right about that. And you talked about running the football. This is what makes this so complicated because Debo Samuel can run the football well, and so can Christian McCaffrey. And then you bring, you mentioned Elijah Mitchell. This is where this becomes interesting because Elijah Mitchell makes this even more complicated because if you're talking about just McCaffrey and just Kittle and Debo Samuel, you're talking about a situation where San Francisco can go in 11 personnel, for those unfamiliar, I'm talking about one tight end and one running back, and you have three receivers, Debo Samuel being one of them, and you can still run the ball with Samuel or with McCaffrey, and you have to account for both people. But if you bring Elijah Mitchell into the conversation – now you can split Christian McCaffrey wide, put Elijah Mitchell in the backfield in a 21 personnel with two running backs, a tight end, and two wide receivers, and still get some of the same looks as far as how they line up. The formations don't have to change because you can split McCaffrey out wide. You can have Samuel in the backfield come out in motion, or you can have him in jet motion, or you can have McCaffrey in jet motion. You can have Kittle split wide. You can interchange all these pieces and make this more complicated to defend. And this is why Mike Tomlin talks about stuff like positionless football. And I, I've been saying this for a couple of years now, Greg, and you know this. Every once in a while, Mike Tomlin will give you a good seed or a good Easter egg that you can listen to and say, okay, now I understand where he's going with this. Positionless football is one of those things because the 49ers can play a whole lot of positionless football with Samuel, with McCaffrey, and with Kittle. So when you have all of these guys in and Elijah Mitchell, who, by the way, is a pretty good running back in just the traditional sense. You mix him into this, and it makes it even harder using the Mike Sullivan adage. It makes them harder to defend. It makes them, makes them harder to play against. For me personally, and you brought up a couple of guys that make this important because DeMonte KZ is going to be important as far as trying to stop these guys in the passing game. Keanu Neal is going to be important as far as trying to stop these guys in the run game. Problem is these two guys play the same position. So now you got to figure out are you going to try to come up with are you going to try to come up with an alignment or a personnel that matches what San Francisco is doing or do you want to come up with an alignment that's completely different and more hybrid to account for everything they're doing? Do you go into that big dime personnel that we talk about with the three safeties where you might have DeMonte KZ, Keanu Neal and Mika Fitzpatrick on the field at the same time with maybe a Desmond King. Maybe that helps you against the run game and the pass game because you have all bases covered. We heard Desmond King uh, earlier this week talk about, hey, I don't know where they're going to use me. It might be a corner. It might be a safety. I'll do whatever it takes to help the team win. And he talked about this coming out of Iowa in the draft. I've played at nickel. I've played at safety. I've played at corner. I've done all those things, and I'm willing to do all of them. This is why signing a guy like that is so important. This is why signing a guy like Patrick Peterson is so important because he's able to do some of the things – that every corner may not do. Plus, when you have the kind of experience that Patrick Peterson has, you have a little bit more versatility there too. So all of this becomes important, Greg, because you're trying to find an offense of Swiss Army knives and trying to figure out what they're going to do. And you have a couple of Swiss Army knives of your own, but now you got to deploy them correctly. And this is where the chess match comes in. But I agree with you. If George Kittle plays, we'll see that in its full splendor, if you will. If you don't, I feel like it gives the Steelers a very healthy advantage. So, yeah, 
Pat Frymuth might want to see George Kittle on the field because game recognizes game. But if you're the Steelers defense, you want to make this as not complicated as possible. And if he's not on the field, that really helps that advantage swing more toward the Steelers. And another thing, too, that we didn't even bring up is the 49ers are one of the few teams that utilize the fullback. And Kyle Juszczyk is a huge piece to that offense and how they run the football effectively. It starts with Kyle Juszczyk at fullback. And Steeler fans remember Kyle Juszczyk because before he was a 49er, he was a Raven. We know this guy. We know what he's capable of doing. And as much as people talk about Connor Hayward now, you check it much different. He can block and he can catch out in the backfield. He's not called upon, upon to do it a lot, but the few times he has to do it, he's available and able to make plays. So he's another piece that makes this so complicated. And I, I'm glad you mentioned you check because this is an offense. And I'm going to say this again, you might be able to put an alignment in that backfield with you check and Elijah Mitchell and McCaffrey, along with Kittle and Debo Samuel and still not be able to stop this offense because of how they're aligned. They could do a lot of different things just based on what those three guys in in particular can do. So it does become a huge matchup concern. But, you know, somebody as as complicated and difficult to defend as Kittle, you take him out and it's a much more concentrated focus. You're probably looking more towards stopping the run than you are towards dealing with the pass. Or maybe that's where Christian McCaffrey becomes more integrated into the passing game. These are all things that you kind of weigh together. And you mix them all up and you wonder how it could happen. But I think that whole challenge, Greg, I think it leads to the next thing we're talking about where Mike Tomlin says, look, we're going to prepare as though we're going to face George Kittle. We're going to prepare as though we're going to face Nick Bosa. So this defense really, I think they're approaching this the right way. And this is where a guy like Terrell Austin becomes important because he has already talked about this alignment of the defensive backs and the versatility of this group. He talked about the alignment of the inside linebackers. He wasn't shy in saying, hey, I really like this group of inside linebackers compared to what they had last season. Because remember, they have three new inside linebackers go in and three old inside linebackers go out. So now as far as the alignment and the personnel concern, Greg, it's an entirely different ability for them, not only to just get guys on the field that can do some of the basic things, but this helps that particular matchup also. And we talked about how excited we are about this defense last year, and now I'm even more excited about this defense this year with all of the moves that they've made, including now they've added Desmond King. Like They already made a bunch of moves, and now Desmond King gets moved into the mix. This secondary is insane. I mean, Patrick Peterson, Desmond King, you've got Minka Fitzpatrick already out there at safety. Love it. I absolutely love it. And they got T.J. Watt and Cam Hayward, by the way, on this defense, too. I mean, you you mentioned everybody else. We haven't even mentioned the two big guys yet in T.J. Watt and Cam Hayward. They're both healthy, and they're both ready to go for this season. They missed T.J. Watt last year with that pectoral injury, and it didn't even look like he skipped a beat when he came back. Imagine a full season of T.J. Watt. And if I'm Brock Purdy, I'm very worried about playing the Steelers in week one, Josh. I mean, this is a really – Really good defense. And again, Purdy coming off of a, a, a tough injury against a really good defense in Philly. If you're him, you're like, why did, Why are we playing the Steelers in week one? I mean, I, the pass rushing, they're going to get to him. And if the Steelers can contain McCaffrey and make it hard for them to run the football, it's going to be a long day for Brock Purdy. I think that's fair. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up, you know, the, the possibility of having to face TJ Watt. Here's the thing even if you're not dealing with T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith, they've also ramped up their depth at the outside linebacker position. You still now have Golden and Herbig to deal with. So this this changes this whole dynamic with Marcus Golden and also with Nick Herbig. This is an entirely different scenario that we're not used to seeing, Greg. You were used to seeing T.J. Watt off the field, and everything kind of condenses, and it becomes harder for that group to get home. Now you got two guys, one veteran that's been doing it for a while who got himself a big contract at his previous stop, and another guy who's coming out of the gate as a rookie, I wouldn't say was what, third or fourth round pick, and he's already impressing as a fourth round pick in Nick Herbig. So now you have a little bit more depth there, and more importantly, and this is for T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith's benefit, you can rotate these guys in now. They don't have to play every snap. They don't have to be holding their, their hips in the fourth quarter trying to suck win because now you can find ways to work these guys in, and maybe there's not as much of a drop-off as far as production or just the ability to get after the quarterback as there might have been in years past. Now that depth makes it a little bit easier. 
Greg, we talked a lot about the tight end position specifically with George Kittle and what the 49ers can do with a guy like him in that matchup with the Steelers. When we come back, we will talk about the tight end position from both sides of the ball. We will talk about Pat Fryermuth and where he fits in with the rest of the league because there's some changing dynamics going on. And this week gave us a pretty good glimpse as to how the A, the tight end position has changed, and B, what the Steelers could do in the future. We'll do that when we come back on fourth down in the Steel City. Let's keep it rolling on fourth down in the Steel City. Josh Taylor, Greg Finley, Chris Mack not with us today, but we are going to continue to roll along here as we get ready for Steelers and 49ers. Week one is just around the corner, just a couple days away. But we talked about uh, the tight end position, and specifically George Kittle for the 49ers in the first segment of this episode. Now let's talk about the tight end on the Steelers side of things. Let's talk about Pat Fryermuth because a couple things have happened this week that bring this conversation much more into focus. Of course, there's Travis Kelsey's injury in Kansas City, and he pretty much is rated by everybody as a top tight end in the game, and it's hard to argue with that. But that becomes a question about his value to Kansas City and his value as a tight end because he has discussed in, pre in previous days and months about how his contract is what it is. He knows he could be worth more, but he likes playing in Kansas City. He loves the role that he has. Now, that becomes more complicated because TJ Hawkinson with the Minnesota Vikings, previously of the Detroit Lions, he got a new contract this week. That makes this conversation a lot more poignant because on the Steelers side of things, Pat Fryermuth, his contract isn't up this year, but it's up after next season. It ends after the 2024 season. Now, right now, things look great as far as Pat Fryer move. He's a $1.6 million cap hit this season. He's a $1.9 million cap hit next season. That's an easy part for the Steelers because he's on a rookie contract. However, let's look at TJ Hawkinson's extension with the Vikings. He's a $4.9 million cap hit this season for Minnesota. But here's what happens in the next four years. $14.1 million, $15.1 million, $19.6 million, and then $21 million. $0.6 million against the cap in each of those four years, respectively. Wow. Which leads us to this question, Greg. It's actually kind of a two-headed question. Number one on this, this two-pronged question, where does Pat Fryermuth rank among the better tight ends in the league, especially among these guys that are starting to get these big contracts? And two, where does his value fit in as far as what he could stand to receive in a possible contract extension with the Steelers? Well, what's crazy, Josh, is – you know, people overlook Pat Fryermuth. Last year, he had 98 targets, and that, and he had a uh, explosive reception rate of 25 percent on those targets. Only behind, wait for it, George Kittle. There you go. And so, I would put him at least in the top 10. I mean, we've gone through our list before that Travis Kelsey's number one, more than likely. Kittle's probably number two. Uh, Mark Andrews probably number three couple other guys would be up there too, but I definitely put Pat Fryermuth in the top 10. I mean, he has been the kind of tight end that when they're in the red zone, Kenny Pickett finds him or at the time Ben Roethlisberger found him whenever Ben was the quarterback of this team. He, he pretty much was like the next Heath Miller. He was a very good tight end in the red zone for the Steelers. And he's always a great option because he catches the ball, he runs good routes, he blocks well, he does everything that they need of him. So I, I think that he's a big deal for this team. I know that they drafted Washington out of Georgia, but that doesn't discount the fact that Pat Fryermuth has been a big deal for this team, and I think they should extend him. I think the drafting of Darnell Washington, and we'll get to him in just a second, I think that opens up a lot of opportunity for Pat Fryermuth because now with Darnell Washington being the guy that can play in line and make those you know particular adjustments and make those plays as a blocker or maybe a second option in the red zone, it opens up a lot more opportunity for Pat Fryermuth. He's a guy you can actually split wide while you keep Washington in line. And this is a discussion you and I have had before because if this team goes into 12 personnel with one running back at two tight ends – you can do a lot with Pat Fryermuth. You can split him wide and keep Washington in line, which gives you the opportunity to both run the ball and throw the ball and have some kind of, you know, some kind of results in either side of the game. So that becomes a really fun matchup bonus for the Steelers. But particularly in Pat Fryermuth's case, you're right. You get into the red zone, 
you got a couple of tight ends and you can do a lot in the red zone with just those guys. You can spread them both out. You can put them both in line. You can bunch them up. You can spread them out. You can move them around. And now defenses are almost picking their poison. Which tight end do you want to key on and which do you want to not put as much attention toward? Or more importantly, you know, which guy is Washington going to run over as far as taking a guy out to make some space for a Najee Harris or a Jalen Warren in the run game? But specifically for Pat Fryermuth, and I agree with you, I'm putting him probably in the top 10 to 12 tight ends in the league. He's probably towards the lower third of that group because there's so many guys you can list ahead of him. You already mentioned Kelsey. You mentioned a couple other guys. I'd put Darren Waller in that group. I'd put a TJ Hawkinson's probably top five. He's the guy that just got paid for Minnesota. I thought he was a really good piece for Detroit, but they moved on from him. And I understand why Detroit did it because it gave them another opportunity to clear out some cap space and bring in more guys that could probably fit that offense a little bit better just to fit that roster. But it does bring that conversation about Pat Fryer move and what his value could be because we have seen the tight end position change so much. It's so much more of a mixed bag now. We talk about running backs being versatile and Christian McCaffrey being such a big uh, example of that because of his ability to make plays in the run game and the passing game. Well, tight ends are in that group now too. You they're they're pretty much split now into two categories: tight ends that can run and tight ends, or should say, tight ends that can block and tight ends that can catch. Well, Pat Fryermuth can probably move himself into that category now of tight ends that are expected to do a lot more catching and maybe not be involved in the run game. And if that's the case, if he's a tight end that specifically you're expected to catch a lot of passes, that does jack his value up quite a bit. So instead of having a 1.6 million dollar cap hit this season and 1.9 next season. You might be looking more at the 4.9 and above that you're seeing from TJ Hawkinson. And that's just before his extension. Double digit salary cap numbers. I look at that and you you wonder just how far that can get, Greg. Because the higher that number goes up, when you got other guys coming around are going to be due for contracts, like a Deontay Johnson, like a George Pickens, like a Kenny Pickett, like a, a Najee Harris, who, by the way, this is a big decision going into next season about his fifth year option going into year four because him and Fryermuth are in the same draft class. Now you got a whole bunch of guys on that offense and you got to make it all fit instead of trying to put 10 pounds into a five pound bag, so to speak. And it'll, it'll definitely raise the stock price on Fryermuth if he has another bust out season like he did last year, whenever he's getting targeted almost a hundred times and he's only behind Kittle in reception rate. I mean, other teams, but other teams will want him, and so that could, uh, you know, put the price up even higher. If the Steelers want to retain him, they want to extend him. It's going to come down to the point of, can you afford to do it? A and is it worth it? Because you have other tight ends too. But I really think that he is worth it because we already talked about it. He's a big deal for this offense. He's a big playmaker, and he does everything they ask of him to do. What if Darnell Washington has a really big season, though? I mean, does that help answer the question already of, okay, maybe it's time to move on from Pat Fryermuth and not pay this uh, extension? And that's also – there's another piece that we're leaving out of this, and that we'll, we'll swing right into that side of it. That tight end room with the Steelers becomes a lot more versatile now because you add Darnell Washington. Granted, they cut Zach Gentry. He didn't make the final 53. He's off to Cincinnati and signs with them. So now you look at this tight end room, you still got Fryer with, you got Washington, but you also got Connor Hayward, who is more of an H back really, but he can line up in tight end and make plays also, whether in line or also kind of off that wing and coming in motion. We've seen him do that a couple of times last season where he came off in jet motion, took some handoffs and closed out a couple of games doing that. I want to say against Atlanta and against also, I think against the Raiders. So we saw that too. But now, Greg, when you talk about the possibility of what Washington could do, you also see what Connor Hayward can do. And it does become what's Pat Fryermuth's value to the team as far as his salary cap value, his protection value, and what's his value as far as the, the diversity and the, the different things that this tight end room can do and the thought of losing him and how it can change all that. Because now, if you're talking about what they could do in these next two seasons while Pat Fryermuth's under contract – you got a lot of different things you could do with the tight end position just because of the versatility alone. But after you get past 20, 2024, how much more does your tight end position group feel that crunch? Because now you're losing that guy that you can split out and become that matchup problem. And the two other guys, while versatile, 
maybe can't do the things that Pat Fryermuth can do. Well, how much time do you think Darnell Washington's going to get in these games? Is he going to see a lot of playing time? Are they going to do two tight end sets? Or are they going to just go with Pat Fryermuth? That's I need to see what Darnell Washington is before I can, you know, decide if keeping Pat Fryermuth is a big is a thing or not. It, it's also a complicated discussion, and this is where this kind of all comes around because I, I've heard this a lot. I've heard this a lot where we have this thing where we have to place numbers on guys. Well, this guy has to do this and catch this number of passes, this number of touchdowns, or this is a failure. And I understand where that's coming from because we are in a dynamic now, Greg. We're in a dynamic of, of watching and observing football where the numbers become the central focus of the discussion. And it's not just because of some, you know, some departure from, from conventional thought of the game. We're in a dynamic now where fantasy football is a big focus, where sports betting is a big focus. So guys need production for their teams to win. They need a certain level of production for those in-game parlays to hit. So all of these things now come around, and some people have, you know, the preseason overs and unders, or in-game overs and unders that they're betting on, and they're hoping for these numbers to hit. But I don't think that's going to be something that drives the Steelers' decision-making as far as the tight ends. I don't think it's going to be, well, we expect Pat to catch this many passes per game or catch this many touchdowns. I think it's going to come down to, A, matchups, who they're playing against, and how they can exploit it. Maybe they can exploit a matchup on a certain week where Pat Fryermuth is split wide and Darnell Washington is in line. Or maybe they can exploit a matchup where they're putting both these guys in line because they're going to try to emphasize the run game more. Or, for that matter, Maybe you don't see as much Pat Fryermuth and maybe Connor, uh, Connor Hayward's in the game because they're utilizing both of these guys' blocking ability and maybe ability to take advantage in play action. All of that kind of jumbles in. So some people will say, well, we're not seeing those much for production from this guy. That may not be part of their decision making. It may just be about how do we want to do this? How do we accomplish this goal and who do we need to do it? And the numbers might be secondary to all of that. And let's be honest, everybody wants the Steelers' tight ends or anybody's tight ends to be Travis Kelsey. And <laughs> and there's just, only one Travis Kelsey. Yeah, and there's only one Travis Kelsey, and there's only one Rob Gronkowski, and there's only one Mark Andrews. Like, not every tight end is going to be a wide receiver like those guys are, but I think Pat Fryermuth is the perfect middle man. He does blocking, and he does receiving, runs the routes, he does everything right. I really think that the Steelers are better off with Pat Fryermuth on this team. And it, it also comes to a greater discussion about tight ends as far as how you use your tight end room, because we've seen it with running backs. And a lot of teams are using running backs by committee, where you have a guy who maybe runs the ball really well. And you might have a guy who catches the ball while in the backfield. And then there's a third guy that can do both pretty well. As far as wide receivers, there's a really good route runner. There's an athletic freak. And maybe there's a slot guy that can make a play here or there, or a guy who can do a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Tight ends are becoming the same thing. Guy who can make plays in the run game, guy who can make plays in the passing game, and guy who could do a little bit of both. That's the case with this particular tight end room. So now that lends to all that discussion about how this can, you know, shape itself. It, I'm one of those people where I can make it about the production if I want to. But if I'm talking about this team winning football games, you might have to set something to the side. Oh, yeah, I'd like to see Pat Pryor move go off and catch 10 passes for 100 some odd yards and a couple touchdowns, maybe that's a, a thing that you wouldn't want to see. But that might not be the thing that wins you a football game. It might have to be Darnell Washington moving some bodies and clearing out one side of the line of scrimmage because you need 25 carries from Najee Harris and maybe 10 to 12 from Jalen Warren to beat a team on the ground. That might have to be the thing that you have. But if that's the case, it's still a good problem to have. It's a good problem from that side of it. The money side of it, though, is where the bigger problems emerge. And those are the problems that we'll see, or at least that the Steelers will see, and that we'll see how they respond to down the line. When we come back, we got a few minutes left here in the show. Want to talk about something that came out earlier this week. Six executives were, were questioned by the Athletic about the Steelers' chances to make the playoffs. We'll tell you how many think that the Steelers can make the playoffs and whether or not we agree with this. We'll discuss that when we come back on fourth down in the steel city pretty much at the two minute warning if you will here on fourth down in the steel city josh taylor greg finley and if you're watching on our youtube channel or if you're watching on the 93 7 the fan youtube channel i should say um i'm trying to keep myself from being as shiny for the room i'm in right now greg 
is still being renovated to get my new office space. And there's not any air conditioning up here. And it's super hot this week in Pittsburgh. It's reached 90s in freaking September. So try to keep myself dry. So before I melt, Greg, let's get to this last thing here. The Athletic polled six NFL executives about the thought of the Steelers making or missing the playoffs. Five of those executives reportedly have the Steelers missing the playoffs. Four of them have them ranked at ninth or worse. On the flip side of things, if you go to BetMGM, 97% of the handle on the win season on the season win prop is over eight and a half. That was the preseason total going in, eight and a half wins. Because, Greg, we know this, eight and a half wins, it's either winning season or losing season. And people know at this point, well, Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season. And 97% thinks the Steelers are going to go over eight and a half, at least according to MGM's numbers. But here's the question. Who's right? Is it the NFL execs, the insiders in the game? Or is it the folks that are going through Vegas here and have money riding on this and maybe have more skin in the game? Uh, well, I'm going to go with the guys that have skin in the game, not because of the money portion of it, but because I agree with them. I have the Steelers winning the division and winning 12 football games. Josh, they won. They had a winning season with a quarterback named Duck. People forget that. <laughs> they won with a quarterback named Duck. Tomlin had a winning season. Come on now. There's no way they're going to have a losing season this year. They, well, they had they, a winning they, record with a guy named Duck because they, they had two games of Ben Roethlisberger and then 14 of Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges. But yeah. Mike Tomlin went eight and six right. in those 14 games. So your, exactly. your point is valid. So they still finished with a winning record. But the point stands. They made their team so much better. We've talked about it during the offseason on and off the air. Defense looks better. Offense looks better. What's the reason that this team isn't going to have a winning season? What's it going to come down to? It's going to come down to Kenny Pickett, and I think he takes a step forward. I think these people think he's going to take a step backwards, but I don't see how. You look at this schedule, it's very favorable for the Steelers. They're playing a Green Bay Packers team that doesn't have Aaron Rodgers anymore. They're playing a Rams team that really doesn't know what they are. Cooper Cup isn't very healthy right now. You have no idea what, what kind of – Rams team you're going to get. You're playing the Cardinals who are tanking for a quarterback in Caleb Williams. They're, you're playing San Francisco that may not have Nick Bosa and or George Kittle like we talked about earlier in the exactly. show. That's a factor too. You're, you're playing the Colts who are going to who's going to have a rookie quarterback and the Steelers defense thrives against rookie quarterbacks. They go 4 and 2 against the division, which is what I expect, and they handle their business against these teams that they should. Josh, they're playing Vegas with Jimmy Garoppolo now at quarterback. You have no idea what that's going to look like. They're playing the Texans, who have a rookie quarterback. Again, it's C.J. Stroud. I think the Steelers' defense is going to make it a nightmare for that guy. You're playing Baltimore, where Lamar Jackson had contract issues and kind of sat out most of this offseason, and he's only getting up to speed now. They have new receivers in that room. They don't know what they are. Odell Beckham Jr.'s coming off of not playing at all last year, and now all of a sudden he's the Ravens' number one receiver. I mean, I, I don't understand where people are on this. I, I've just let, named a bunch of reasons. The Titans might have Malik, Malik Willis as their quarterback whenever the Steelers play them because Tannehill might be awful or injured because they can't run Henry 80 times. They, they can't. And that game is a Thursday night game. In Pittsburgh at Akersher Stadium. And exactly. you and I have talked about this for the years that we've worked together. When it comes to those Thursday night games, the home team has so much more of an advantage in those games. This is where I also point out that Mike Rabel has not beaten Mike Tomlin yet head to head. But we'll save that until we get to that Steelers, closer to that game. And the Steelers broke Cam Newton and the Panthers on Thursday night. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced that's a thing. And that's another theory we could discuss for another time. But I, I agree with you on this. I think the Steelers' schedule puts them in position to win double-digit games. Uh, former, another former former executive, Doug Whaley, he talked about this on the 93.7 The Fan Morning Show. He thinks they can win 11 games. I think they can win 11 games. I think you've got them winning 12 games. For me, it's a matter of how many of those non-division games they can win, and the schedule does favor them for a lot of those. But the division games, I'm with you. If you can split with Baltimore and Cleveland – or if you could split with Baltimore or Cincy and sweep Cleveland, you're talking about a four and two division record. And that's a favorable position to be in. And it's hard to win this position, win this div division. 
if you don't win at least three division games, but if you win four, it puts you in a much better position. I think they can win at least three. I think it comes down to how well you play against Cincinnati. If you can get one out of two against Baltimore, but you cannot afford to get swept by either team, I think that becomes a problem. And they actually split with all three teams last season. They split with Cleveland, they split with Cincinnati, and they split with Baltimore. So if you can improve just one of those games, I think I talked about this in the season preview. You can improve one of those games. You're talking four and two in the division. And after that, you only got to win seven of those remaining 11 non-division games. That makes it a much more advantageous situation to be in. And I'm with you on this one. This roster, when you look at last season's roster and you take this one and you like kind of put them on the same glass, like up against the light, this roster looks way better than last season's roster. This offensive line looks way better than last season's offensive line. This roster's depth looks a lot better than last season's depth. All of those situations, and oh yeah, by the way, this season's starting quarterback was not the starting quarterback in week one last season. This one came in in week four as a rookie in the middle of the game and had to pretty much learn on the fly how to direct this team. But after the bye week in those last nine games, they went seven and two. They went off on a high note as opposed to a low note. So they're going to come into this season, especially after the preseason that they had, on a much higher note. <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice is starting to get a little scratchy. That's why I wasn't here in our last episode. That is, I think, our cue to leave. But I'm going to remind everybody, subscribe to this podcast. Like this podcast on the Odyssey app. Follow this podcast on Apple, or Apple Podcasts as well. Hit the subscribe link down low on YouTube to watch this video. That way you get updates for every show that gets released, both on the podcast side and on the video side. Because as we reminded you, week one's around the corner. Once this season gets on, on a roll, we are going to be coming at you pretty much every day or close to every day with content talking about your Pittsburgh Steelers. Chris Mack should be back tomorrow, assuming everything is okay. I should be back tomorrow, assuming my voice holds up. Greg's always here. He's the mainstay of the group. I, I'll, I'll quote uh, Val Kilmer in Tombstone. Greg, you're an oak. <laughs> you're the guy that he's here every day. But hopefully we're back at full strength tomorrow. For Greg Finley, I'm Josh Taylor. See you tomorrow.